This meeting is now being recorded. You can begin, Becky. All righty. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Using Results from Improve HF to Improve Local Evidence-Based Heart Failure Practices webinar hosted by AAHFN. The American Association of Heart Failure Nurses is an approved provider of continuing nursing education by the Washington State Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. This activity is worth one CNE. Before um, our speaker gets started tonight, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping notes before um, introducing um, Nancy. First, all participants must know that this session will be recorded and posted on the AAHFN website for educational purposes. Since this session is being recorded, all attendees have been placed on mute. Individual attendees will be taken off mute during the question and answer time to ask any follow-up questions at the end of the presentation. To submit a question, please click the question and answer section located on the right side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, the moderator will ask each question submitted during the call. If we run out of time and do not answer your question, you can send it to tfield at ahint.com and your question will be submitted to the presenter. In order to receive credit for this session, you will need to complete an evaluation form. An email will be sent to you with the link to the evaluation at the end of the webinar. A certificate will be mailed to you after you, after you have completed the evaluation. The evaluation site will remain open for 30 days. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for this event, Nancy Albert, PhD, RN, CCNS, CHFN, CCRN, NEBC, FAHA, FCCM. Ms. Albert is an active clinical nurse specialist in heart failure and a nurse scientist with a research focus on improving clinical patient outcomes. She was a steering committee member of Improve HF, an ambulatory cardiology practice, multi-center process improvement and research program that has provided observational and correlational data about the provision of evidence-based practices of cardiology teams. The planning committee tonight is, consists of Rebecca Castro and Mary Jane Swartz. Um, both of us, along with Nancy Albert, have no real or perceived conflicts of interest that relate to this presentation. This activity has no commercial support or sponsorship. Um, and th with that, we'll go ahead and, and let Nancy take over and get started. Thanks so much, Becky. Well, I'm very thrilled to be here tonight, so I want to thank the planning committee for inviting me to speak on this topic. It's a very important topic to me because I think we don't enough attention to the quality monitoring, and I think there's a lot we can learn. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll listen in and that you'll have some questions for me at the end. We should have time for at least a few questions and, and maybe uh, more than a few. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, just by way of disclosure, I uh, was a previous steering committee member of Improve Heart Failure. Uh, you can see the rest of the steering committee over here. It was a nice eclectic group. We had one PharmD, uh, myself as an RN. We had two electrophysiology physicians and many clinical heart failure physicians that all participated on the steering committee. Um, and again, I have no conflicts of interest uh, with this presentation as I've not been on the steering committee for two years now. It's, um, it's been finished. So what are our objectives today? Well, I hope to uh, do a few things, but two of which would be to discuss the two areas of weak documentation that I think can really affect optimization of heart failure treatments. So I just want to make you aware of where we're at and hopefully discuss the value of a process improvement program that focuses on performance measures that are associated with known evidence-based care for our patients with heart failure. So just by way of background, as a reminder, I know most of you on this call probably know this already without me telling you, but there are a lot of gaps and disparities in the care we deliver to our heart failure patients. Um, there are quite a few articles in the literature that talk about those gaps and disparities in terms of hospital-based care, and there's a few single-center studies out there that talk about it in terms of um, outpatient practices. We know that in many cases, life-saving drugs may be ordered, but not at the right dose. We know that we may be, may be missing the mark in terms of giving device therapies. And even uh, evidence-based guidelines related to expert opinion, which would include things like being on a low-sodium diet or uh, exercising um, every day to prevent deconditioning, et cetera. 
We also know that medications and device therapies are rapidly evolving. And so if we don't get a handle now on what's currently known and get up to par in terms of providing uh, evidence-based guidelines, um, it makes me a little bit nervous to think how long it will take different centers to get on board with the new devices and new medications as they become available. And there are quite a few things in the works. Who knows if they will all pan out, but um, we may see that happening in the near future. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is that therapy is more complex, and when, it, when we speak about the outpatient practice, even more so than in a hospital setting, collaboration among physicians can be challenging. I know when I give talks out of town, sometimes I'll find out that it's 60 miles from the clinical cardiologist's office to an EPS office, um, that there may not be anybody close by, there's no hospital close by, there's just um, a lack of resources. So we just need to keep in mind that we need to come up with better ways to collaborate so that we can all do better. When we think about heart failure care in an outpatient practice setting, really for, the, uh, for improved heart failure, when we started this study, there was very little known about contemporary rates of using guideline recommended therapies in an outpatient setting or the variability across practices. And I don't know about you, but certainly my team at the Cleveland Clinic, um, the minute we talked about doing this study, all of the physicians on my team and even my NP colleagues said things like, of course we give great care, Nancy. Of course we follow the guidelines. And so the assumption is for probably most of us out there that we do wonderful things, that we try hard, that we're excellent caregivers, and we don't really need to monitor ourselves because we're doing well. Well, hopefully when you see the results, you'll get a sense of how well we're really doing, um, on a national level at least, and you'll be able to see how there's room for improvement. And it may mean your practice needs to improve, just like I found out our practice needed to improve in some ways. So keep in mind that the data regarding the extent of evidence-based care in an outpatient cardiology setting and even variations across practices may provide some important insights into patterns of treating our patients and may give us a clue to what we need to do to improve care. And hopefully when I show you um, some data that's specific to my site at Cleveland Clinic, you'll get a sense of what, of what the kind of information is you could learn from doing uh, quality improvement programs. So as an overview to improve heart failure, for those of you that don't know much about this study, it's the largest, most comprehensive quality improvement study for heart failure patients in an outpatient setting, and it was designed to enhance quality of care of heart failure patients by promoting adoption of evidence-based guideline recommended therapies. We wanted to evaluate the utilization rate of evidence-based guideline recommended therapies, and we also wanted to have sites attend educational workshops so that we can at least provide them. We wanted them to set treatment goals. We wanted them to develop customized pathways and put processes and even systems in place in their outpatient departments to assure them that they have a, uh, the best opportunity for improving over time. We gave every site uh, disease management tools to help improve quality of care that they deliver. And you'll be able to see some of those on a slide coming up. Globally, the goals of the study were to improve outpatient treatment rates for uh, evidence-based guideline recommended therapies. We also wanted to discover the treatment gaps, and you'll get a sense of what those are in a little bit. Um, and you just keep in mind that it's really important to do that in a real-world practice, and that's what improved heart failure does. Um, I love randomized controlled trials. I think we learn a lot from learning about uh, uh, results of randomized controlled trials, but we need to remember that in randomized controlled trials, there's often a lot of patient exclusions. And so, for example, the average age of a patient may be 61 years old, yet you and I know that the average age of our patients are maybe 70 or 73 years old. And so we're not really comparing apples to apples all the time when we look at the results of randomized controlled studies. So using quality improvement data can give us a sense of where we're at. It's hypothesis generating. And it'll help us advance understanding of best approaches to identify appropriate patients for, uh, that are indicated for therapies. And we did learn a lot from this study related to that. For example, one of the results that we published in the literature, we learned that having an electronic medical record did not make any difference in improving evidence-based guidelines. 
So a lot of times people make excuses for why they're not where they need to be. Oh, we have still paper documentation. It'll be better when we get to electronic medical records. And again, we found out it really didn't make a difference. So learning those kind of nuances can help us get a sense of way to head to make So when we talk about site-specific We wanted to track her failure medication devices and even how the documentation of patient education was looking. We wanted to offer practical information on, and disease management tools to the different sites that were involved. And we wanted to create a system of practice profile reports that the uh, individual practices can use on their own to see how well they, they did. So in this slide here, you can see some of the education and implementation tools. Everybody got pocket cards that had algorithms on it to help them make sure they were practicing at the evidence-based level that was expected. We developed patient education materials in both English and in Spanish that were available to use if people wanted to, if they didn't have their own uh, education materials. Uh, everybody got copies of the clinical trials and current guidelines in a binder. People got uh, clinical assessment and management forms that they could place on their uh, medical, medical records to help give them a um, kind of a flow chart, if you will, to remind when it was time to consider uh, checking into a device or time to up titrate drugs, et cetera. Uh, we had a website available and we offered a lot of education online for different uh, sites to attend to help them do a better job. Um, in terms of the practice profile re uh, report, I actually found this a really interesting report. I would sit out for hours playing with it at times. Um, we were able to look in, at a practice level at uh, individual physicians or, or practitioners. In my case, we also monitored uh, myself and my colleague, uh, advanced practice nurse. Um, we were able to look at ourselves and compare ourselves to national aggregate data, to regional data, to, um, to other groups. We were able to um, see over here benchmarking and so we could figure out exactly where we were at and uh, do some benchmarking. And we were able to look at, um, for example, in this picture you could see the ACE inhibitors and you can see how you improve over time. And so it was a really nice benefit for us to be able to uh, have this kind of reporting system available. So let me tell you a little bit about improved heart failure and then we'll get into some of the results. Um, this was an interesting study in the sense that there were three different cohorts of patients. The first cohort was a longitudinal cohort, and that's cohort A that you see over here. So we uh, looked at patients at baseline, and we did chart reviews on all these patients, and then we followed the same patients again at 12 months and at 24 months. And we did that on purpose because we wanted to see if there was changes in practice treatment practice patterns relative to baseline data over time. So we wanted to see if in individual patients we saw changes in process improvement based on our intervention, which was all the education features and all the handouts, et cetera, that we gave the different practices. We also had two other cohorts that we only monitored at one point in time. We had a group of uh, patients that were monitored at six months and then a group of patients that were monitored at 18 months. And these single cohorts allowed us to characterize practice treatment patterns at one point in time and look to see if we were getting a better sense of identifying patients not receiving indicated therapies at one point in time. So both cohorts were very instrumental in giving us a, the big picture about how well we were doing in outpatient practices. The primary goal was both for practice site improvement and patient improvement. At the practice site level, we were looking to see if over the two-year period, over a 24-month period, if practices would observe an aggregate of a relative 20% improvement in at least two of seven performance measures we were monitoring. And I'll show you those performance measures coming up. At the patient level, we, our goal was an aggregate improvement in 20%, relative 20% improvement in at least three of the seven performance measures. So we didn't expect sites to improve in all seven performance measures. We figured they would target various measures to improve on their own. And we were looking for two at the practice level and three at the patient level. Here are the seven different performance measures we looked at. 
And you can see there are very common measures out there. It's nothing new and shocking to anybody. Uh, the use of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, the use of beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, anticoagulation therapy in patients with atrial fib, implantable cardioverter defibrillator, cardiac resynchronization therapy, or and documentation of heart failure education. And for all of our performance measures, just like the performance measures you see in the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association performance measure guidelines, we, uh, our denominator did not include patients who had documented in contraindications or intolerances, so they were removed from the denominator. When we look at our pr process measures, you can see that all seven of them were class one uh, when we're looking at the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines. Class one means you should use these therapies. When we look at the level of evidence, you can see that uh, five of the seven were level of evidence A, meaning that there's multiple randomized controlled studies or meta-analyses out there to support their uh, Azosterone antagonist was level of evidence B. We started the study in 2004, and back then the only uh, trial was still the Rowles trial, so that's why it was level of evidence B. And you can see heart failure education was our one level of evidence C, and that was expert opinion. And since that time, we've actually had new evidence uh, to upgrade it slightly. Um, you can see that four of the seven performance measures that we chose were official American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association performance measures. So they were already out there in the literature as things we ought to be assessing on our patients in an outpatient setting. So when we look at patient and practice enrollment criteria, I want you to all keep in mind that this is a study that was for patients with systolic heart failure. So these are the HEF-REF patients, patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. In order to be included in the study, patients had to have either heart failure or prior myocardial infarction with an ejection fraction of 35% or less. So they could have been asymptomatic post-MI patients with a low ejection fraction and still been included. We uh, excluded patients who we thought had uh, one, less than one year to live. So if we saw liver cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, end-stage renal disease, uh, if they were in a palliative or hospice care setting, we excluded them. And again, we included outpatient cardiology practices, so not internal medicine, but outpatient cardiology practices. But we used all regions of the country, and we included single specialty or multi-specialty groups. So when we talk about methods, um, the data collection methods for the study were medical records. And for those of you that work in hospitals or in outpatient practices, you know that if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. And that was true for us as well. So keep that in mind. We were, had to rely on documentation. Uh, so that means if patients had contraindications and they didn't document them, we didn't know they existed, those patients could have been included in the denominator. Um, the other thing we did is we asked each practice to complete a survey to tell us about their practice characteristics. So again, there could be possible limitations to that data in the fact that maybe the person completing the practice characteristics site didn't really know the answers and were guessing. But we feel that we get very strong responses from all of our practice sites. Now, I know most people say UGG when they see a statistical method slide, but I just want to um, talk about a few terms because you're going to see them coming up when I show you the results, and it's uh, good for you to understand exactly what we were talking about. There were two different types of scores that we calculated when we were looking at process of care. One was called the composite score, and the composite score took all seven measures and looked at the sum of each of them, how well you were doing, were you at 67% or 98%, and then we just created a sum of all seven measures to see how each practice or how each patient did from a composite. We also created an all or none measure. Now the all or none measure meant that you either were receiving all of the measures or if you were even missing one measure, you fell into the none group. So you could have received everything except cardiac resynchronization therapy, 
but if you had cardiac resynchronization therapy indicated based on evidence-based guidelines, then you fell into the none group. So you could have been doing good in many measures, but if you just missed one, you got knocked off the all and fell into the none measure. And then we looked at process of care conformity over uh, between baseline 12 and 24 months, and we'll show you that. We also realized that early on, some sites were bigger than others. We had some practices that were very large with many members, and therefore we had a lot more patients to collect data on. So for example, at Cleveland Clinic, we collected data on 500, over 500 patients, 544 I think to be exact. Other sites had smaller heart failure practices. They may have had a big cardiology practice in general, but they weren't all heart failure patients. And because of that, uh, with a smaller volume, we wanted to control for site-specific differences. There may have been one or two or many doctors who did a great job of care and one doctor who did not in the practice. And so we used generalized estimating equation methodology to control for variations among individual practices. So when I show you the data, I will be showing you the data after we control for individual practices. And then we also did data um, analysis that controlled for patient characteristics and practice site characteristics. So we could really get a good idea of how well these performance measures are being followed after controlling for the nuances of many of different practices and patients that were involved in this. So how many practices did we have total? Well, we had 167 practices. We had 15,381 patients that were entered into the registry. These include patients all in cohort A, B, and C. So you'll uh, recognize, remember, cohort A is the cohort that was measured at baseline and then at uh, 12 months and 24 months. But when we added all the patients from B and C in, we had over 15,000 patients. We did lose some patients at 24 month follow-up among the 7,000 plus that were in cohort A, um, and uh, we lost 16.5% of the patients overall. Um, we had 12 practices that uh, were unable to give us data at the final point, um, and we had 76% of our practices that were able to document vital status, so was the patient alive or not alive at the end of the two-year point. So to give you an idea to see if you fall into one of these areas, um, we can see that about 39% of our practice sites were in the south, 32% uh, in the northeast, and then you could see the central and west, we had a little bit less involvement. Um, I thought you'd be interested to see that most practices were non-university, non-teaching settings. So this is your everyday John Doe cardiology practice out there in the community setting. Uh, they were 24% were multi-specialty, so most were not multi-specialty. And you can see that the mean number of cardiologists in the practice was 12, the median, so 50% of practices had nine cardiologists. You can see the average number of heart failure patients man managed annually was around 3,000, but 50% of the practices had less than 2,000. When we look at other characteristics, only 27% were hospital-based. So again, most of these practices were community practices. Very few transplant centers, less than 10%. Most suburban. You can see only 34% of practices had a heart failure nurse. This isn't a heart failure advanced practice nurse. This is any heart failure nurse. So keep that in mind that a lot of practices out there are running without heart failure nurses. We have to talk to those doctors, I believe. Um, we can see that um, in terms of a heart failure clinic, less than half of all practices had a heart failure clinic. I was personally a little surprised when I saw that. I guess I just assumed more people had heart failure clinics out there. However, a device clinic was pretty popular. About 78% of practices did have a device clinic. Again, when we broke up the physicians in the practice and put them into groups, you can see that almost half of the uh, practices had between one and 10 physicians. And most practices only had one electrophysiologist on board. So you can see very clearly that most of the physicians were either clinical cardiologists or interventional cardiologists. And 87.4% of the practices did have interventionalists on their practice team. Okay, so what about the patient characteristics? 
Well, we'll talk about the yellow highlighted one in a second, but you can see here the average age of our patient was right around 70 years old, so much older than typical randomized control trials. In cardiology practices, unlike internal med practices, I thought you'd find it interesting to know that more patients are male. In internal medicine practices, when we read the research, it turns out that the female to male population is about 50-50, and that may be because more internal medicine patients take care of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or our HEF-PEF patients. But in cardiology practices, it seems like they get, they're more likely to get patients with reduced ejection fraction and they're male. Uh, less than half are white. You can see 9% are African American. And the reason why that doesn't add up to 100% or near 100% is because you'll notice in yellow, almost 50% of patients' race is missing. Now, why I highlight that so importantly is because we have one set of drugs out there, our hydralazine and nitrates, that ought to be used in patients who are self-described African Americans. Yet, if we don't document race in our chart, we may be missing an element of care that we're not really sure about. So again, this was one problem when it comes to missing documentation. You can see that 65% of our patients had an ideology of ischemic cardiomyopathy. That's not surprising with 71% of the patients being male. Um, and again, these were all people with low ejection fraction, so that kind of makes sense. And you'll notice that as you might expect, there's a lot of comorbidities, 61.7% hypertension, 34% diabetes, 39% post-MI, um, over 30% had prior coronary artery bypass grafts, and you'll notice 31% were in a, had a history of atrial fibrillation. When we look at the mean ejection fraction, it was 25%. You can see that for systolic and diastolic blood pressure, for the most part, patients out there in the community have very normal systolic and diastolic blood pressure. They've got nice low resting heart rates. Remember, you never want to see your resting heart rate be above 78. Um, so thankfully, it was in the low 70s. But if you look at the standard deviation of 11.5, we did have some people that had resting heart rates that were probably faster than they ought to be. Most patients do not have ROLs, but you can see about 20% had edema. Serum sodium is pretty normal. BUN is probably slightly above normal at their high end of normal. Creatinine, again, probably is closer to the high end of normal. And you can see that QRS duration is certainly a little wider than we would like to see at 129 milliseconds. Now here's another interesting fact that was bothersome to me specifically, and that is that 67% of patients had New York Heart Association functional class documented. That means that 23% of patients, or I'm sorry, 33% of patients did not. And that's bothersome because as you and I all know, that we have some drug therapies like aldosterone antagonists and device therapies that rely on New York Heart Association functional class. So if we're not documenting it, it may mean that we're not paying good enough attention to when our patients are worsening and maybe they need to have new uh, therapies added to the regimen. The other thing that I thought would be interesting to point out is that very few of our patients are really advanced heart failure. So if we look at general practices out there for the 67% that we had documentation on, only 30% of patients are functional class three and four. Most patients we treat in an ambulatory setting are in functional class one and two. So just kind of keep that in mind that in general, uh, only about five, less than 5% of patients are functional class four at any time, and um, most patients are in functional class one and two. And again, you can see that 52% of patients had a QR restoration greater than 120 milliseconds. All right, so how well did we do at baseline in terms of conformity to quality outpatient measures? Well, again, you can see here, if you look at some of the uh, numerators and denominators, so on most of these slides, if you look down here at the numerators and denominators, you can see that even though there were 15,300 patients in the study, some patients were excluded because of the fact that they had documented contraindications. You could see there were many excluded for aldosterone antagonists, partially because they didn't have functional status documented. So since we couldn't 
see their documented functional status, we didn't even know if they met the criteria. So when you look at some of the results, there's some alarming things to pay attention to. Again, 20% of patients who should have been on an ACE inhibitor because they met the criteria for it were not receiving this life-saving therapy. If you look at aldosterone antagonists, the majority of patients weren't receiving therapy. And again, this was only for the denominator that we knew were in functional class three or four or had advanced heart failure and they were still symptomatic. There may have been many more that could have been on it, but we just didn't know. Here's another big problem area, anticoagulation for atrial fib. Clearly, 31% of patients um, are not on it and we're putting them at risk for thromboembolism. Again, cardiac resynchronization device therapy at 39%, ICDs at 51%, and something that's not very hard to do, documentation of heart failure education. We could only find it in 61% of charts. All right. Now, this uh, box plot just gives us an idea of how well we're doing when we're looking at practices. And I show it to you because you can learn a lot when you see what's going on in practices. The blue line going across the middle is the median. So you can see for ACE inhibitors, when we look at practices, 78% of practices, of, of practices, 78% were uh, had patients on ACE inhibitors. The box itself tells us the 10% and the 90th percentile. And we can see these little arms give us the rest of the percentile. So if we look over here at CRT, you can see that 10% of, pa of patients or, or practices did not have even one patient on CRT therapy. So it could have been a practice that we monitored that gave us 30 patients or gave us 300 patients and nobody in that practice was receiving therapy. So that was pretty alarming. Um, and you can see in some other cases where, again, there was big gaps uh, getting to the high end of the percentiles. So you can see that there was a lot of variation in practice sites in terms of how we use data. What I'm gonna show you now are the individual practice sites just to give you an idea of the variation in care. So for those of you sitting out there like I was when I started the study saying, you know, we do a great job. We don't need to monitor ourselves. Um, hopefully these next few slides I'm going to show you will just give you an idea that maybe we do need to monitor ourselves. What I want you to pay attention to is over on the left side, um, we show from highest to lowest practice, each bar, each black, purple bar rather, is uh, one practice site. And so if we look at ACE inhibitors, and we look at the high end, we can see that one site had 100% of patients who met the criteria for an ACE inhibitor on an ACE inhibitor. So in some sites, they got above 90%, but it was alarming to see that not even one site was able to get 100% of patients who met the criteria on the therapy. And then you could see the sites way down on the right-hand side that got very few patients on therapy. So this is even more alarming. I always wonder who those sites are. Would you want your mother or father or your best friend to be treated at those sites? So when I show you each of the different uh, processes, pay attention to the high and the low end so you can see where the gaps are. So again, if we look at beta blockers, we can see that at least two sites were able to get 100% of patients on evidence-based therapy. It certainly gives us better idea that if two sites can do it, more than two can do it. But again, you can see over on the right side of the slide where there were some gaps. All right, now that data starts to get a little bit uglier, this is aldosterone antagonist. Again, we had two sites that were able to get 100% of patients who met the criteria for aldosterone antagonist on it. So for those of us out there who say, well, it can't happen, it's never gonna happen, it can happen. Some sites were able to do it. Now over here, you're gonna notice a big gap. These are all the sites that had not even one patient on an aldosterone antagonist. So consider that there's a lot of sites over here where not any patients were receiving life-saving evidence-based therapy when they met the criteria for therapy. So keep that in mind. So how well did we do on cardiac resynchronization therapy? Well, the good news is that there's a lot more sites now, I could almost count them on two hands, that we're able to give 100% of patients who meet the criteria the right therapy. 
but look at the big gap over here. So you can see that lots of variation in practices. The overall mean was low, and lots of, difference, uh, lots of differences between different practice sites. For ICD therapy, whoops, I went a little too fast there. For ICD therapy, again, a handful at the top who were able to have 100% of therapy patients. Um, and on the right, again, you see where there's some institutions or some practices where not even one patient was on evidence-based therapy. Anticoagulation, the same kind of picture. Again, the median is 70%. So we can see that 30% of patients aren't getting therapy, but some sites were able to do it well, and other sites didn't do it at all. And then finally, heart failure documentation. You can see again over on the right, we had one site. I'm hoping they did educate patients, but just didn't do a very good job of documenting it. But some sites just did a very poor job overall, and other sites were able to do it for nearly all or all of their patients. Now, when we look at the results at 24 months, I want you to pay attention to a few things. Um, on the second column, you see baseline data, so you can see the percentage. And then the next column over is at 24 months. And obviously, when you eyeball going across, I'm hoping you're looking to see that the percentage went up so that we can see that we were using a process improvement program. We can see improvement in how well we give these therapies over time. We could see the absolute improvement over in this column. And in the column closest to the right, we could see the relative improvement. Remember that our goal at the practice level was to see at least two of the seven measures have a relative improvement of at least 20% or more. And so you can see we saw a relative improvement in beta blockers. We saw aldosterone antagonists improve dramatically. We saw cardiac resynchronization therapy improve dramatically. Look at this from 37% to 66%. So just seeing your results at baseline and realizing you're not doing as well as you thought you were really kind of spurred some of these practices on. I know we targeted aldosterone antagonists, and so hopefully we were the helper bee in getting this number up a little bit. Um, you could see the ICDs improved, and even heart failure education improved. And again, you can see the relative improvement in some sites was very dramatic or for some practices, but overall, we certainly had more than two of the practices that met the criteria. So when we look at the longitudinal cohort, 123 of 155 practices, or 79% of practices, met our goal of at least a 20% relative improvement at two years. All right, so if we look over here at this slide, this is at the patient level now, and now you see the denominator in terms of patients, not practices. And again, baseline, 24 months, absolute improvement, and relative improvement. And again, if you just eyeball across each of these, and you look at the data in terms of uh, patients, you can see that there was an improvement in the use of ACE inhibitors, an improvement in the use of beta blockers, a huge jump in the improvement in aldosterone antagonists. Interestingly, no improvement in anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. An improvement for CRT, ICDs, and even heart failure education. And again, if we look at the relative improvement, we can see that there was, again, more than 20% relative improvement in three or more practices or processes, I should say. So again, from a longitudinal cohort, we did meet our goal of at least three uh, of the different process uh, measures improving by greater than 20%. For those of you that like to look at bar graphs, again, what this slide shows you is baseline in purple, 12 months in blue, and the 24 months in green, and you can see the stepwise increase over time. You could see for some drugs or devices it was much bigger. Aldosterone antagonists, CRT, and ICD had the biggest improvement. They also had the most room to grow. When you start off at 86%, it's a little bit harder to get higher. But here's where we were flat, and this was really concerning to me, that we didn't do a very good job overall of improving anticoagulation care. So when we looked at follow-up, we also wanted to look at mortality. And again, at 24 months, we found out that 22% of our patients um, with complete vital status had died. 
And one of the things we did is we looked to see what were the characteristics of patients who were more likely to not be alive at 24 months. And there were four glaring uh, differences between patients who were alive and those who were not alive. Patients who died were more likely to have ischemic heart failure etiology, and I think that's been well documented in the literature, so most of you who keep up with the literature probably knew that already. Patients who died had more comorbidities, specifically diabetes, hypertension, obstructive pulmonary disease, peripheral vascular disease, and depression. People who died were more likely to have renal dysfunction. And here was an interesting one for us. Patients who were more likely to be dead at 24 months had a lack of baseline process measure conformity in five of the seven in performance measures. So when we looked at the conformity measures and we looked at the overall conformity, patients who died had at least five of seven measures where they really had low uh, performance. And so it does matter to give quality care, and we can see that in this study. Again, for those of you that like to see things in bar graphs, this just shows you blue are the people who are alive at 24 months, orange are the people who were not alive at 24 months, and you could see the statistically significant differences, even in anticoagulation therapy at this point, for patients who were alive versus not alive. The only two factors that did not seem to be important were documentation of patient education and aldosterone antagonists. Then the other thing we did is we looked at deaths within 24 months. So if you go up to this column, second column from the left, and these are patients who followed or had good conformity to the measures. And then the next column over are deaths within 24 months in patients who did not conform to the uh, measures. And again, if you look at each of the different process measures, you can see the difference in deaths. And in almost every process measure, you can see that the death was much higher in patients who did not conform to the process measure as those who conformed to the process measure. And that turned out to be important for ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, for beta blockers. It turned out to be important for anticoagulation, for having an ICD, for a CRT, even for heart failure education, this is the all or none. You'll notice the denominator is much smaller for the all or none because a lot of patients uh, didn't meet the criteria. And, but again, for patients with all or none, if you followed all of the measures, you did much better in terms of mortality than if you did not follow all of the measures. And then you could see for the composite care, so we were looking at the total score. Um, and again, over here, you could see the unadjusted odds ratio. Unadjusted odds ratio reflects that generalized, sorry about that, uh, equation, the GEE modeling we did for the sites, and the adjusted ratio is the, uh, the modeling we did that took into account all the patient characteristics and the practice characteristics. So if we look over here at this data, we can see that receiving an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker in terms of process improvement, you had a 49% odds of being alive if you followed uh, conformity to angiotensin receptor blocker, a 55% odds of being alive at 24 months if you were conforming to a beta blocker and on down the road. If we look at the data using um, uh, favoring measure performance, or not favoring measure performance, you could see it was only the aldosterone antagonist uh, that got us into trouble. And we believe part of that was the fact that um, patients had renal dysfunction, um, and, and uh, patients who were more likely to have renal dysfunction in many cases were more likely to have symptoms, and they may have been placed on aldosterone antagonists. But again, remember, it was the patients with high BUNs and creatins that were more likely to be uh, not alive at 24 months. But you can see the benefit of being on our evidence-based therapies. So I guess the moral of the story here is following the guidelines really does matter. When we look at some other data, I just want to quickly go through before we finish here in a few minutes. Uh, we did a sub-study analysis looking at males and females in our database. And so you can see over here that there were differences in different characteristics between males and females. 
And again, you could see over here, again, just more details about characteristics of males and females. You'll see that in general, uh, their ejection fraction was about the same, their weight was about the same, even though they're, uh, some of the values uh, show statistical significance when you look at the numbers, they're very close to each other. Um, again, you can see that heart failure nursed in practice and, and some of the other variables, no differences between males and females. When we looked at all or none care for men and all or none care for women, we can see that compared to baseline and 24 months, both groups had improvement in absolute improvement and in relative improvement. Um, we could see that the improvement looks like it was a little bit higher for women than men, but both groups improved. When we look at composite scores, both males and females improved. So again, we should be able to do a good job of improving care for both males and females equally. Now, I did a little sub-study to look to see if disease management mattered. So I don't know how many of you have a disease management clinic, but we wanted to see if having a disease management program made a difference. We were only able to look at data at the practice level, so keep that in mind. You can see over here that compared to patients who had a heart failure clinic in blue and people who did not have a heart failure clinic in green, that there were some differences. Patients in a heart failure clinic were more likely to be on an ACE inhibitor a beta blocker, and they were more likely to receive heart failure education. When we looked at the data after controlling for the practice level data, you can see that some of the variables continue to be statistically significant if you had a disease management clinic. So in these cases, we had a 23% improvement in ACE inhibitor or beta blocker use. You can see at the multivariable level, once we controlled for all the patient and practice characteristics, Having a disease management program seemed to be important for cardiac resynchronization therapy and for patient education. We also looked to see if, having, if you had a nurse practitioner or advanced practice nurse or a, physician's, a physician assistant on board made a difference. We compared no NPs or, or PAs versus greater than one but under two versus two or more. And again, when we looked at differences between uh, APNs or PAs being part of the care team, there weren't a lot of differences in how care was delivered. In fact, when we looked at univariate analysis on this graph, there were no differences at all. Once we controlled for site-specific differences over here, these, uh, both of these are site-specific differences. Over here you see if you have greater than one APN or PA but under two, over here if you have greater than two APNs. And you can see that if you have more than two APNs, you're 25% more likely to give an ACE or an ARB. You're 12% more likely to use beta blockers, 27% more likely to use ICD therapy, and 45% more likely to document heart failure patient education. On multivariate analyses, after we controlled for all the patient and practice variables, you can see a lot of the improvement went away statistically, even though we saw uh, improvement in general. Again, uh, when there was two or more APNs, we saw improvements in ICD therapy and patient education. And then the final data I'm going to show you is data from a single center site. So I just wanted to show you what kind of data you could get from your own site to see how well you're doing. At our site, we had 1.2 advanced practice nurses. At the time, I was the .2 APN, and we had another nurse who was full-time. We had 13 physicians on board, and we collected data on 544 people. At the, at the practice site, I was able to get data at the patient level, not just at the practice level, because we were able to go into medical records and find out which of our patients actually had APN care or did not have APN care. When we, the first thing we had to do is define what APN care is, and we defined APN care in two ways. The first way was APNs who took care of 30% or more of the patient visits within a two-year period. And 19% of the time, uh, out, of, out of 500 patients, 105 patients were cared for by an APN at least 30% of the time over two years' worth of visits. We also wanted to see what happened when APNs provided greater than 50% of the care. So we used 60% as our denominator. 
And you can see we only had 11% or almost 12% of patients, 65 patients, that received 60% or more of their care in a two-year period by APNs. Um, again, for those of you that are curious, when we looked at uh, differences between physician providers or APN providers, we found out that APNs were more likely to have uh, patients who were not white, so not Caucasian, but no differences in some of the other variables you see here. We found out also that APNs were more likely to take care of patients with hypertension history in their medical records. APNs were more likely to take care of patients who were symptomatic, either functional class 2, 3, or 4, compared to patients in functional class 1. Physicians were, had many more patients in functional class 1 than the nurses did. And then finally, we found out that nurses, the APNs, were much more likely to take care of patients who were a little bit wetter. They had lower serum sodium levels, and that was statistically different compared to physicians. Otherwise, though, patient characteristics were relatively the same between physicians and nurses. When we look at care at the 30% level, you can see, again, MDs in blue, APNs in green. And again, when APNs provided care relative to physicians, there wasn't much difference in, in delivery of care. The only two that were different were ICD. You could see nurses were less likely to send patients off for an ICD, and nurses were less likely to give an aldosterone antagonist. So again, from a practice level, we're able to not only see how well we're doing overall, you could see we were giving over 90% of our patients beta blockers, and over, um, and over almost 90% of our patients um, ACE inhibitors. So you can see your general uh, scores, but you could also see if there's differences between groups. When we looked at 60% of care, you'll notice now in some cases the APNs were doing a better job than even the physicians, but there was no statistically significant differences between groups. So keep in mind, no statistically significant difference between groups. So we can say that nurses give the same care or equivalent care to patients than physicians do. When we uh, looked at APN care at the 30% and at the 60% level, we wanted to see if after controlling for those patient characteristics we talked about earlier, functional status, serum sodium level, ethnicity, et cetera, if there were still differences in performance between physicians and APNs. And you can see that at the 30% level, the only variable that stayed important was implantable cardioverter defibrillators. This statistic here says that 64% or 66% of the time, uh, physicians are more likely to uh, have a patient go for an ICD than nurse than APNs. When we look at nurses who gave 60% or more of care, all of our variables went away. There was absolutely no difference in care between physicians and nurses. And then the last slide I'm going to show you over here in relation to this data is we wanted to try to get a better handle of why we saw a difference in the use of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator in our patients. So we uh, looked at the other factors that were important to patients receiving an ICD. Interestingly, we wanted to see if there was any difference by caregiver gender. And so we looked at female caregivers versus male caregivers. Now, in our heart failure clinic, we did not have a male caregiver who was an APN. And you can see that the odds of a male caregiver giving an ICD was equally as bad and statistically significant as the APN. So this means that male doctors, in this case, were also not using ICDs um, as well as they should have. So we decided after we saw this data that it probably wasn't really the APN versus the doctor that was at, at fault. When we looked at other data, we saw that um, Caucasian patients had a two and a half fold increase uh, rate of getting an ICD, that patients who were in chronic atrial fib were more likely to get an ICD, and patients with a wide QRS were more likely to get an ICD. And so we concluded that we probably were doing a better job of getting patients over to the electrophysiologist if they had symptoms, if they were in atrial fib, if they had a wide QRS, and it was probably our post-MI patients who were asymptomatic or had only mild symptoms and were feeling great that we weren't getting over at the rate we needed to.
And so we started paying attention to, to where we needed to make changes in our system so that we could do a better job. So when we talk about the value of process improvement programs, this is my last slide over here, and I just want to remind us all that a process improvement program can identify modifiable gaps and disparities in our care. We can compare practices in patients to other national centers, regional centers, other like programs. We can help facilitate care that's evidence-based by learning where we're not doing so well and changing processes and, in, um, and systems in our practice to do a better job. Um, it'll help us all do a better job of having a mindset of improvement versus I'm doing well, there's no changes I need to make. So it'll get us out of that status quo mentality. And it may promote research that leads to new knowledge because you may want to find out why you're not doing well and, and do more to help yourself improve over time. So I'm going to stop over here. I think this is my last slide, and we'll see if Becky or TC can open it up for questions and answers. And I thank you for your attention at such a late time in the evening. And so far we do have one question from Maureen Distiller. Do you happen to know what percentage of the study locations had electronic medical records? I ask as I work for the VA NAD, having EMR makes it very easy to keep track and initiate measure to meet our performance measures. That's a great question. And um, I can tell you that over time, the use of EMR went up. When we first started the study, it was really quite low, 11%. Um, and over time, it went up to about 29%. But the majority of practices did not have EMR. So actually, it's a very low use. Now, of course, we all know with the healthcare reform by the year 2015, everybody, or 2014, I believe, everybody has to have an EMR in place. So we're going to see a lot of uptake of EMRs in the next few years. But currently, it's much lower than I even thought it was. I thought there were more practices out there with them. So you're right, it does make it easier to keep track of data and it makes it easier to monitor yourself, but first we have to get practices to get them in place. Questions that are still coming in right now. Okay, great. Becky, Becky did you have any um, comments or questions? No, I didn't. I thought it was a great presentation. Thank you so much, Becky. Thanks. Uh, we also do have a similar uh, Elliot, who has mentioned that it's the powerful motivating data, and also wants to thank Nancy and the Education Committee for organizing and presenting this webinar. Uh, it looks like we do have somebody else who's possibly submitting a question. Study. Take a moment. And unfortunately, I'm not sure whose numbers are whose, so it's hard to unmute right now. I'll, I'll make a little comment while we're waiting for some questions to come in, and that is that when I first started the project at Cleveland Clinic, our physicians made uh, wonderful excuses for why the data was the way it was. And then once we started showing them um, what the results were in aggregate and started talking about how we could do a better job, I was happily uh, shocked and surprised at how quickly we made changes um, once the doctors um, saw the data, especially for aldosterone antagonists and anticoagulation use at our site, those were the two that we decided to target, um, they immediately jumped in and started looking at their charts differently, I presume, or looking at their patients differently and trying to see if maybe they were the cause of the low scores um, because we showed them each their data individually at um, so they were able to see their own data, but it, we only showed the practice level data to everybody. Um, and so they were able to go in and see if they were probably the culprit uh, for the low score. And really they, as individuals and as a team, they really jumped in and tried to make improvements. Um, somebody asked a question of Becky about pocket cards being available for use. And uh, if you go into, I believe it's a 2008 manuscript published in American Journal, all of the data or all of the information that's available on the pocket cards are actually published in the American Heart Journal manuscript. Um, so it is available to you, yes. Nancy, is that the reference that's on a couple of the slides? 
Um, the, the American Heart Journal reference is not on the slides because I showed you slides with the results, which was after that time. Um, but if, um, if TC or Becky reminds me, I'm happy to send a copy of the reference and you can um, put it with us. We could add, like, add it to the last slide and make it available to people. Okay, that would be great. And, and the, I have a question, the, the tracking information that you use, you know, to keep track of, of how you, of your data, is that available mm -hmm. anywhere? Okay, so the question is, is uh, tracking of data available? Um, Get With the Guidelines actually has an outpatient improvement program. I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but the American Heart Association has a project called uh, it, um, uh, Heart Failure Advantage, and, um, and the Advantage program actually is meant for outpatient practices and you can uh, sign up to be part of the Advantage program if you have an electronic medical record. And uh, you'll get the kind of data that I showed you in the earlier slide with all the pr national, you know, regional, your own app practice for yourself, like, like systems, et cetera. So you can see data almost exactly like I showed you for improved heart failure. Um, if you go into the Guidelines Advantage Program as part of American Heart Association. So if you go to the uh, American Heart Association website and type in Guideline Advantage, you'll find out much more about their program. It's a wonderful program. Thank you. Okay, I see one more question. We do have a follow-up uh, from Becky in regards to the, the pocket cards, and uh, is the information that was used like the pocket cards available for you? Um, I already answered that question. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Um, we also have one from Joanne. It says, have seen a MD decreasing ACE, I, and beta blocker at heart failure recommended doses to add, I'm going to slaughter this now, hydrolyzine, lysine, I, and I, I, I could do it. I'll, I could do it for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank nice you. Okay, so the question is, um, Somebody has seen a patient, a doctor, decreasing ACE inhibitor and beta blocker and adding hydralazine and isozorbide dinitrate. Um, it's okay if a physician chooses to decrease an ACE inhibitor and add hydralazine and isozorbide dinitrate as a combination therapy, especially in patients who have worsening renal function and cannot stay on an ACE inhibitor or have high potassium levels and cannot stay on an ACE inhibitor. So there are reasons why we would decrease ACE inhibitor use in favor of hydralazine and a nitrate, in this case, um, uh, isordil or isozorbide dinitrate. However, beta blocker is a completely different class of therapy, and we should not be decreasing a beta blocker to put somebody on a vasodilator, such as a hydralazine and nitrate combination. So again, I could understand decreasing an ACE inhibitor use or even angiotensin receptor blocker use to get somebody on uh, hydralazine and isordil if indeed they have worsening renal function or they have very low blood pressure and cannot tolerate the other drug. But beta blockers should not be reduced at the same time. So that means there's a, a, a problem if they're also decreasing the beta blocker. So I see there's a few other people typing. Um, if you have other questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right, two people are typing, so we'll hold off for a few minutes. The rain has finally gone away at my house, so that's a good thing. I was worried that you guys would hear tapping on my skylight sunroof while I was sitting here. Okay, Tracy Carey's got a question. It says, how do you explain patients managed by APNs greater than 60% of the time more likely to be volume overloaded? Oh, that's a nice one. Thank you <laughs> for that question. Um, I think what happens is physicians, um, in some cases, choose to give patients to APNs to care for that are patients that may um, need more tender loving care. And oftentimes those are patients who are either debilitated, patients who are very symptomatic, patients who are near end of life, um, patients who have emotional strife because of their heart failure. So they may have a lot of uh, crying jags or be weeping or 
just very emotionally charged, um, patients who ask a lot of questions. And so it just seems, it makes sense to me that oftentimes APNs get the patients that are not the quick in and outs for physicians. So um, I'm not, I wasn't surprised at all, and my colleague Maureen was not surprised at all to see that we were more likely to get patients who were symptomatic. Um, so I think it just goes along with the territory of depending on the physician and the comfort level of physicians allowing APNs to take care of some of what maybe are their sicker patients. Question there from Maureen. Uh, was there any difference based on financial basis, such as clinic with a high, say, Medicare medication rate, or med Medicare Medicaid rate, sorry? Okay, yes. Yeah. So um, at, the, at my level, I could tell you that when we saw the um, differences in ICD care, the first thing we wanted to see is if it was based on income. And the only variable we have based on income was to look at the insurance type. And we did look at insurance type, and there was no difference in insurance. So I could tell you that at least at our site, the fact that um, some patients were less likely to get ICD care um, one of our physicians thought right away maybe they couldn't pay for it, and that's why it was the case. But that turned out not to be the case. So there is another good excuse that didn't uh, pan out, I guess you could say. So learning more about the answers and finding out if indeed that is the case or not can help make you think differently about changing the direction of how you deliver care. All right, I don't think I see any other questions at this time, so I think we're done. So I, I guess I'll, I'll close by saying thanks very much for hanging in there and attending, and I hope you found it enjoyable, and uh, thanks again for inviting me to present. Okay, thank you again, Nancy. This is Becky. Um, thanks to everyone for participating on this webinar. An email will be sent to you no later than tomorrow morning with a link to the evaluation site. Um, also, um, a link to the handouts will be sent as well. If you do not receive the email by tomorrow at 10 a.m., 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time, please contact Teresa Fields, WAHFN Assistant Executive Director at 888-452-2436, extension 5. Please join us for our next webinar on hemodynamic monitoring to be presented by Cindy Wetzel on October 26th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Information on how to register will be posted on the WAHFN Education Center which you find on the AAHFN website, www.aahfn.org. Thank you again, and have a great night.